tell you a little bit about themselves. So I'm gonna ask everyone to kind of give a brief introduction of who you are, where do you work, how long you've worked there, and what your practice area is. I'll go ahead and, and get us started, uh, Josie. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Redding. I am Associate General Counsel um, for our Commercial Contracts team at Gap Inc. I've been um, with the company uh, about nine months or so, um, coming up on my uh, one-year anniversary in, in, a, in a few months now. Um, so like I, I said in my title, you know, my team primarily supports our commercial contracting function, uh, not just for you know, all the different brands that we have at Gap, um, Gap, Old Navy, Athleta, and Banana Republic, but also um, our contracts for our, our back office functions as well. Great, I'll go next. I'm Hannah Cole, Associate General Counsel at Becton Dickinson, which is a medical device and technology company. I've been in-house at BD for about almost nine years now um, and started off actually at, at CareFusion, which was a company that got acquired by BD shortly after I joined. And I focus on employment law. Um, I'm so I'm Todd Shampo, uh, Associate General Counsel at Gap Inc. Yes, uh, Mike and I do uh, work closely together on a lot of things at Gap. Um, I've been at Gap a little bit longer. Uh, it'll be two years this summer in July and really focus a lot of my, myself and my team um, oversee a lot of the corporate work for Gap Inc. as a public company, uh, you know, including advising the board, the executive team on a lot of governance issues. SEC reporting and then M&A and a lot of corporate finance work that we're doing as well, kind of uh, globally. So that's it. Okay, I'll go next. I'm Mary Hardy, uh, as mentioned, at, currently at Microsoft Corporation for five months now. Before that, I was at Qualcomm for 13 years and uh, always specializing in open source software and IP and currently in uh, open source and standards uh, group. Um, I, I'm Caroline. Oh, I'm, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mary, were you That's done? That's okay. I was just gonna say, if you want me to explain what open source is, I can, but it's not, I don't think it's relevant to today's discussion. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Ken Perry. Uh, as Josie mentioned, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the San Diego Padres. I've been with the club just shy of 12 years. I became a COO at the start of this year. Prior to that, I was on the legal side. I started as associate general counsel uh, uh, and moved up through uh, the company to be general counsel and uh, on to COO. Well, I'm going to direct the first, we kind of broke up the questions. So I'm going to direct the first questions to um, Carolyn and Todd. What is, I think one thing everyone will probably wanna know is really what is an in-house counsel? What is your role? What's the value you add to a company? What does that look like? I think your value really varies depending on what type of company you work for, specifically how large the legal department is. So I'll speak from the perspective of a very small legal department. The Padres traditionally have had a two person legal department, which means that we are jacks of all trade and masters of none. Uh, which uh, so we leverage outside counsel significantly, but um, I've always viewed the role of outside of in house counsel as really partner with the uh, business units in the company to help them to evaluate risk, to potentially restructure the way that they're planning to go about things so that it sets the company up in the best position from a risk perspective. Um, there's the obvious stuff around working on any litigation that comes up, but again, that's something we really leverage outside counsel for, so it's more management of that. Um, in, in some ways, I view it as a real life issue spotting exam, uh, working with the business side folks to figure out where potential issues are, when you need to bring in an expert, when you have enough expertise to be able to advise them. So just really serving the function of a counselor uh, for the company in uh, advising on big decisions, big and small. 
Yeah, no, I, I would I would actually very much agree with that. And and my experience has been, you know, smaller company, larger company, it doesn't necessarily differ all that much in my experience in terms of uh, the in-house role, you know, it's kind of experience being a mile wide and, you know, let's just a foot deep as opposed to vice versa at, at a firm. Um, but I would just say, you know, in terms of the role of an in-house counsel, it's really understanding the business and understanding the business objectives. And so it's, you know, it's kind of one step from the, the, lead, the law school experience where you're applying the law to the facts and coming up with a, a conclusion. And in-house, I always feel like it's one step further, meaning you apply the, the law to the facts and then you have to apply that to the business um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And sometimes there's things that might be imperfect from a, a legal standpoint, but ultimately achieves the business objectives. And so just making sure you're, you're really in tune with what the business is driving at, what the intent is, what the strategy is, and then providing a, a kind of a menu of options, so to speak, um, to be able to go forward and ultimately achieve the business um, objectives. Thank you. Next question is for everyone. Um, tell us about your path to the planning in the in-house council. I can start on that one. I think in some ways my path was pretty um, pretty common. I had been at a firm, I was at Paul Hastings right out of law school. I was there for about seven years. And as my career progressed, I started focusing a bit more on the counseling side of employment law as opposed to lit litigation. Um, well, sort of, I added advice and counseling onto my already heavy <laughs> litigation load is probably more accurate. Um, and I realized that I wanted to start looking for in-house roles. Uh, I was realistic that it would take a, a while. I wasn't interested in relocating. And San Diego um, at times can be a relatively small market, especially if you're looking for an in-house employment attorney gig. Um, and this was back pre-COVID when remote in-house counsel roles really didn't exist. It's a little different now. So I started looking and um, a colleague of mine who had been at Paul Hastings and left to go to a different firm, I reached out to her and she said, they're going to hire at CareFusion, so I will put your resume through. Um, and I applied at CareFusion and was hired there about four months after I decided I wanted to go in-house. So it was much, much faster than I anticipated, um, but it was due in large part to sort of connections and having someone who was able to kind of put my resume um, at the top of the recruiter's pile over at CareFusion. I can jump in also. I, I mean, I think I have a, a pretty similar path as, as Hannah did. I started at a firm also. Um, I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, um, you know, I, I worked at that firm for approximately five years. But I tell you, within about the first 18 months, I knew that firm life wasn't for me, um, you know, for, for like the, the rest of my career. And so, you know, one of the one of the great things about the firm that I was at was, you know, with our our junior associates, the, the partners essentially wanted us to get really good at what we did. And so we didn't have, you know, a lot of pressures of, of bringing in clients and, and, you know, generating revenue at, at the start. And we could really focus on becoming, you know, the, the best at, at what we were trying to do. And so, but, you know, transition to how I, you know, moved to my in-house position, you know, similarly, I had a colleague, you know, in my corporate law practice group that had left and, and took an in-house role. And we just stayed in contact and, you know, I just started sharing like, hey, I'm looking for a change, looking for a change. And, you know, when an opportunity arose that, you know, kind of fit my skill set, you know, I shared my resume and, you know, again, you know, she helped me kind of get my resume up to the front in front of the hiring manager and, and just, you know, utilizing my network to help me kind of get my foot in the door there to, you know, start the interview process. I can go. Um, very similar approach, I think, an experience for me um, came up through a a firm in the corporate department. Um, you know, I always knew that I, I wanted to be an in-house attorney, even I think before I started at a firm and kind of leveraged the experience of the firm and, and the training of the firm um, in terms of, you know, to, to become the, the best attorney and I could be at during the time there. And um, I didn't have a time frame horizon, but really 
what happened for me was had the ability to work on, you know, a lot of different clients. And just so it happened that one of the, my clients at the time had an opening, um, you know, in a role that I was directly supporting actually on the outside counsel side, Harley Davidson. And so when that role came open, I just, uh, you know, it, one thing led to another in terms of the relationship I had with some of the in-house attorneys uh, managing that work. And so ultimately that's um, how I got in-house. Um, not to make it sound like we all came through the exact same path, but I had a similar story. I was at a firm in the Bay Area and had um, had joined a firm intending to make that uh, the majority of my career. But once I got into it, I realized that the um, the work-life balance was not really what I was looking for. Uh, that's not to say that I don't work a lot of hours at the Padres. I certainly do. But it was more the unpredictability of being a transactional associate. And um, so as a mid-level, I started to sort of look around, see what might be available. I had really never thought about coming to work in sports, but was approached by a headhunter uh, who had the listing for the Padres. I'm from San Diego originally. The Padres are my childhood team. So too good of an opportunity to pass up. Similar to Hannah sent my resume in. The recruiter said he would sort of put me towards the top of the stack and went through the interview process and ultimately ended up joining the Padre. So my one and only in-house uh, job has been with the club. And I think we saved the weirdest for last. I uh, graduated from Thomas Jefferson School of Law, right, during the last economic uh, downturn. So I had, uh, everyone assured me, you must work at a law firm. You can't just go straight in-house. No one does that. And I was, I wanted to work at a law firm. I felt like it would be great to have that kind of, you know, mentoring and experience, but law firms weren't hiring. No one was hiring. <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible timing for me. So I started to um, support a solo practitioner doing some litigation work. And I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do um, for, forever, but it was so educational. I'm really grateful for that experience. And while I was doing that, um, a few months in, I was contacted by Manpower, which is a temp agency. And I had, I'm sure I had sent my resume to them and I blanketed San Diego basically with my resume. Um, and he said, this is a paralegal position at Qualcomm. Would you be interested? And I thought, well, I'm actually, you know, I don't have paralegal skills. It's certainly a unique skill set. Um, but it's a way for me to get my foot in the door and I can see how an enormous patent department is run. They have more than 50,000 patent families. And uh, I thought it would be you know, just very educational at a minimum. And after I was there for six months, they gave me a permanent position and then moved me over into an attorney position as soon as one opened up. So it was a little bit odd, but it's, it was, I was very grateful for that experience. That's awesome. Um, thank you all for talking about your experience. I think one of the keys to um, learn from this is um, networking and knowing people and really getting, being brave and just putting yourself out there um, is one of the, uh, seems like all of us all had kind of similar of putting ourselves out there, taking chances with, like Mary said, of I'm just going to get my foot into the door. A lot of us all knew people. Um, same with me. I knew somebody, um, and that was how I got my position. So um, don't don't forget to network. Um, for those who transitioned from law firms, Hannah, Mike, Todd, what was the biggest thing that surprised you about being in house? So uh, I'll I'll start. I think for me first, I don't I don't want firms to get too bad a rap. When I when I went at the firm, it was a place that I wanted to be. I, I actually really loved working there. Yes, it's a lot of hours, but you know, being an attorney is a lot of hours. <laughs> so um, I thought it was I thought it was lovely and um, was a, really just because I wanted to focus on the counseling. So when I went in house, I think what surprised me the most was something that I think Todd it was that said right at the outset, which is instead of having really deep expertise, you you were looking much more broadly. And when I asked the, the GC at the time when I was interviewing, what was the trickiest thing about going in-house when she had, and she said, um, it was feeling like you're committing malpractice every day. And I thought about that a lot in my first several months of being in-house, being surprised by questions that I would never have seen. Um, 
internally at a firm and didn't really know even how, how to answer or where to start. So getting my, my bearings there. The other thing too, I think is um, when you're at a firm and you're providing advice, it's a lot more uh, transactional. This is the advice. This, this is the parameters. This is how you can do your options. But when you're in-house, you then have to take that. And again, echoing something that Todd said, you take that and then you have to apply it internally and implement it at the company that you're working at. So getting more of that sort of project management and um, implementation experience was something I hadn't really thought through, but ended up really enjoying. Um, I can go. And so I think for me, very much along the same tone that, that Hannah just described, and it's, I always use this concept of the 80-20 theory um, in-house, and it's, you know, like 80% of the effort is is taken up by closing the last 20 percent of the detail right and so in-house oftentimes at least well i would say maybe backing up my firm experience it's a very exacting experience right it's it's all about precision it's all about getting the right answer um and, and communicating in a very precise you know way in-house what was the biggest thing for me is making decisions quickly with less than all of the information and then being comfortable that sometimes those decisions are going to turn out the way you want them to, and sometimes they're not, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because at the end of the day, sometimes being exactly right is more detrimental to the business than, you know, moving on and taking calculated risks with less than all of the information. And so understanding that that spectrum of decision making, and sometimes it's absolutely worth the, the time and effort to close the last 20%. And sometimes it's not. And, and really understanding that so we're not slowing the business um, or impeding the business, so to speak. And I think that was just that mind shift for me was probably the, the biggest eye opener. And so, you know, Todd and Hannah both spoke to kind of more substantive issues. I'll talk a little bit outside of that and, you know, kind of how, you know, it, it felt going from a firm to in house. And I'll just say, like, you know, at, at a firm, you're part of the, the revenue generation cycle, right? You know, you're, you're billing and, and you're bringing money into the firm. And so, you know, at least my experience was, you know, whatever you kind of ask for, like, hey, I need this to help me do my job better. And, you know, the next day it's, it's, it's there or, or, or you get the message, it's on its way. You know, at, at in-house, you know, for the companies I've worked at, there's just, you know, there's a lot more justifications. There's, you know, budgetary issues, all that sort of thing. And so... You know, I, I just recall, you know, different times when I when I got to my first in-house job and say, oh, I need this, I need this. I'm like, you can check the closet and if it's not there, you know, submit a requisition. It may come, it may not, sort of deal. And so I, I, I you know, and I, I laugh about it, but like at the time, I, it wasn't so funny <laughs> um, just because I had gotten used to, you know, kind of that, that firm life and, and you know, every, everybody kind of catering to you. You know, you have multiple assistants and, and kind of support staff and that sort of thing. And you know, being in-house, you know, I think generally speaking, most of us don't have, you know, a, you know, significant support staff that just are, are kind of waiting for you. You're, you're definitely going to be more self-sufficient and being able to um, kind of be resourceful as well is, is another, you know, um, quality attribute to have. Um, and then, you know, just at, at different companies, and I, I think it, it varies by your organization, but just the, the layers of, of, kind of approvals, bureaucracy, if you want to call it that, um, just being able to navigate, you know, your particular organization. And so I think there's definitely some skills that, you know, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's necessarily talked about in law school, but like kind of developing those kind of people interpersonal sort of skills is, is also something that, you know, was a thing that I, I focused on, um, you know, when I went in-house as well. I would just maybe just double, uh, double onto that. And, and the time it takes for decisions to get implemented and executed internally, uh, you know, and in-house is so different. You know, at a law firm experience, it's more like, here's the right answer to the client, do what you will with it. And really just having the strategy in-house to say, okay, if we have to achieve something by X date, understanding how long it would take to turn the aircraft carrier, so to speak, and then backing that up and then kind of figuring out strategically what you need to decide and when, because you know you could advise something and say we need to do this and 
it might be totally unfeasible from a transformative standpoint that could take months, not days, right? And then, so just understanding that strategic, like where are we going and how do I have to make decisions well in advance is definitely a change as well. Yeah, I remember going in-house, the there's two things that shocked me. One, the, the cost center that Mark Mike kind of brought up is you're a cost center, not a revenue generating thing. So you're not like on the high priority of the business. And then also I was a litigator. So um, when there's litigation, for me as a litigator at a firm, it was the most important thing. But being in-house, um, I'm asking people trying to get documents for RFPs to get to my outside counts. And they're like, well, here's the folder we had stuff in. You can look through it. We don't have time. Like it's not their emergency because they're trying to get different offers, offerings out, services. They have their own sprints. They have their own timelines that they're trying to hit. And they're like, you, the litigation that you're doing is not their top priority because they're still trying to keep the business running. Um, oh, so Mike, Todd, Mary, and Hannah, I know you guys all discussed, um, working at different companies, um, some big, some small can, um, can you talk about the different dynamics of the companies slash industries you've worked in? And if there is kind of a difference between working at, I know Hannah, you said you were at a small, you were at a smaller company that got bought by a big company. I kind of did the same thing. Like, what is that dynamics? When it when it comes to the the acquisition, I think it's a it's a unique it's a unique experience to be part of a, a company that's that's acquired. Um, and for me, I'd been at Carefusion, which was a relatively new standalone company. It had spun off or divested from Cardinal Health, and so because of that, it had started um, it sort of started from scratch when it did that, and it felt a little bit like a startup. So things happened very quickly. There was a lot of tolerance for mistakes, um, as long as they were fast. <laughs> so make decisions quickly. We can undo it later. And um, when we when they announced that we were getting acquired, one, it's nerve wracking because you're not sure, especially if you're in this cost center, a shared service, are they going to need another employment attorney? Yes, they'll need all the product folks because they're buying this this company for the products and the the IP, but you know, so there was that level of uncertainty. And then secondly, BD is um, 125 years old. It is a very old company. It is global. It is, it was at the time much, much slower at getting things done. So they didn't want to make quick decisions that could be mistakes. They didn't want to make mistakes and they wanted to be very collaborative um, as far as getting to a decision. So you would have to consult with everybody <laughs> to decide how to how to move forward. So it was a it was a very different feel culturally. Um, it also was different to be at suddenly at a company where the headquarters were no longer in San Diego. Um, and so when you're not in headquarters, you don't have that um, easy touch point with your general counsel and with the business leaders at times. And so that that can be a little bit challenging to maneuver. But I think that what was cool about being at a company that got acquired and given the different cultures of the two companies was seeing over time how they how they merged and sort of took the best of both because I do think that BD's been on a on a journey since the care fusion acquisition to be more agile and nimble um, and to be okay with the the possibility of a mistake as long as we can recover quickly and, and keep moving. Uh, you know I can I have an interesting, probably just juxtaposition in terms of some of my experiences. You know, on one hand, I started at Harley Davidson and I'm at Gap right now. And I think my experiences at those two companies are very similar in the, in the sense of they're both kind of large institutional, kind of big name um, companies, very branded, retail focused. There's a large creative component to both. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, because it is those two experiences for me are very similar in the sense of they're they're big so it takes long time to to make decisions it takes long time to make changes but then there's this creative component within that that's like move fast and break things right and so in both of my experiences at those two companies a lot of what i was kind of calculating was how can we move faster how can we be more risk tolerant and then kind of create that you know, across the company in, ter in terms of decision-making and so forth um, so that we could become more nimble 
um, from a decision-making process. Between those two experiences, I was at AMN Healthcare. Um, it was a very different experience in the sense that AMN was growing um, very fast, uh, largely by acquisition. And you know they had been a public company for some time, but I think the, the growth and the speed of the business far, um, I would say, exceeded the, the rapidness of the legal infrastructure to some extent, right? So we were kind of catching up on how do we get best practices? How are we implementing this in a rapid growth environment? Um, so it was just interesting for me from kind of an industry standpoint in terms of large, um, how to become more uh, risk tolerant to um, in the middle, kind of how do we catch up with the speed of the business and implementing infrastructure and things like that. It's been interesting to hear Todd talk a lot about risk tolerance. Uh, some some of our clients may be less risk tolerant than others. <laughs> so, um, and I know the question was about differences, but I'm still pretty new and at Microsoft only five months. And so I see more similarities than differences. Um, the client, as you know, is our company, but the businesses that we're supporting, they think of you as their attorney, at least in the you know, scope of the business, of their business. And every group, every team working on something thinks that is the most important thing because, you know, of course it makes sense. It is to them. And and so as uh, in-house counsel, you might have to make some judgment calls about prioritization because everyone that you ask will tell you that, yes, this is the most important thing, but is it to, to your real client, which is the corporation, you have to, you know, sometimes use your judgment there. Yeah, and I've worked for um, you know a, a few organizations now. Um, you know, obviously I'm at Gap Inc. now, a very large you know global company. Um, my first job actually was was with Manpower Group, um, and so they are another you know large global company. And you know those two were, I'd say, are are probably pretty similar, just in the way that our legal departments were structured, the way that decisions were made. It seemed um, you know a, a bit more siloed. With, with kind of like our responsibilities, you know, at Manpower, I was kind of still doing primarily contracting work. At Gap, I'm doing primarily contracting work. Um, and so I, I don't know if it's just, you know, due to the size of, of the organization to make sure that, you know, that we can have accountability and, and somebody's actually gonna be responsible for these different areas. And, you know, something, you know, happens, you know, the organization knows where to go. But I, I, I tend to think that may be part of the reason, but, you know, the, the two companies I worked in between, you know, the second company, it was a, a smaller private organization, which I would say is, is different. And, you know, uh, Carolyn, I think it probably operated similar to how it was at the Padres because I was one of two attorneys there. And so I was, I felt, you know, even more embedded within the business and, you know, sitting in on, you know, different meetings that, you know, may not have a, a true legal aspect or event to it, but, you know, I enjoyed it because, you know, served as a, kind of more of an advisor role. And it's not just like, hey, the lawyers here is it's, you know, I'm, I'm part of the team and, and really thinking through the decisions and things like that. And I'll say like at that private company, you know, things tend to move quickly, right? And, and, and you know, you make a decision, you only have to talk to, you know, two people maybe as opposed to, you know, running through four or five different departments. And so I'd, I'd say that that's, you know, some of, some of the differences and, and then the company after that, I would just say it was another public company, but you know it was smaller, and so I think it was a lot more collaborative. Um, it was kind of that mix between the siloed approach and, and the collaborative approach of, of a private company. Thank you, guys. There are some things that stuck out at me. Like definitely the amount of meetings you're invited to that don't necessarily require legal counsel or the questions that you get that are necessary legal questions. And then also Hannah, the use of ag agile. You get points for that. Those are like, <laughs> there's certain words that you will only hear when you become in house When you start working at a um, corporation, agile is one of the ones that everyone loves to say <laughs> in every meeting. And I there was there when I was interviewing at Care Fusion, um, one of the interviewers was like, "You're going to meet with Wally, and Wally's big on corporate speak, so I'd like you to keep track of all the yeah. all the terms." It was like leverage, synergies, boil the ocean, um, oh, yeah. agile, like parking <laughs> lot, 
we're yeah. going to parking lot that. <laughs> and then all the acronyms. There's acronyms yeah. for every single thing. But you have to have like a glossary of all the things. <laughs> so next up is I know a bunch of you have worked with um, managed outside um, council. Um, for those who have worked with um, outside council, I believe Ka Carolyn, Hannah, Todd. How do you manage those relationships and how has your perspective changed of outside council now that you're in-house? Um, I mean, I can start. We um, we leverage, as I mentioned at the beginning, we leverage outside council pretty heavily since our in-house legal department is pretty small. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, it becomes a mix of people that you use regularly. Uh, like the firm that we use for employment law, where we're just going to ping them with some regularity on specific one-off questions to larger projects that we're going to look to bring on outside counsel for to help us for some finite period of time pretty intensely. Um, <clears throat> so it just, a lot of it comes down to building, um, for lack of a better term, a stable of relationships that you have with mostly firms in San Diego. Um, we do some work with the big national firms, but just for cost reasons, generally try and stay more local so that you know who you can call if you've got a particular issue, or at least you know who you could call to get a referral um, on an issue if it's something that you haven't dealt with before and you don't have an outside um, relationship for it already. I mean, in terms of, of managing them once once you have them, I think a lot of that comes down to what the particular needs are, both of your business and the specific thing that you're working on them with. Uh, one of the things that I always like to do at the beginning of relationships in particular is I go through their bills with a pretty fine tooth comb to sort of set the expectation from the beginning that I'm going to be rigorous when it comes to their billing. And uh, especially if it's a larger firm where they've got both associates and partners staffed on a deal because once you sort of set that tone from the beginning then you don't you know then I find that the bills coming in just tend to be a lot cleaner uh later on in the relationship I guess they get tired of fighting over them um but I mean those are sort of the the broad strokes and then more the minutia of um, how I've managed out outside counsel here at the Padres so I can um chime in here so you know the way I kind of view outside counsel is is two different things and it really depends on the type of issue and in, in work I mean my experience is I've always leveraged outside counsel for uh, you know a good chunk of of support on one hand what I really like to get from outside counsel is first and foremost um, someone that's invested in not only myself but our, our business and our company so really understanding like I've said before like, what is our business strategy um, how what how have we done things in the past? And, and to have that kind of consistent lens across um, a lot of things. And then to really give me, what I like to do is say, you know, give me that exact answer, give me the technical right answer. And then it's incumbent upon me to understand what the risk is around that um, and be able to translate that in house the way it should be. Um, but really understanding like the very technical and then the broader context of our business is one thing that I, I leverage outside counsel um, significantly for. Um, and the other is, you know, my story about this is, you know, it's it's somewhat overflow, I would say, but I remember when I was trying to transition to um, in, an in-house role and there was a partner in my firm that I worked very closely with is, uh, and he said, you know, Todd, the best thing about being in, in or a firm lawyer is, you know, when you're on vacation with your family and you get the call from a client that says, you know, we need you to go to New York or something to do this deal and you drop everything and you go and do it. If, if you don't live for that um, because they want you to do it, you know, then go in house. And then when I, when I got to Harley Davidson, I was having a conversation with the general counsel and I remember him, I told him that story and he said, Todd, the best thing about being in house is when you're on vacation with your family and there, you know, an emergency or something comes up, you know, I call outside counsel and say, I need an answer tomorrow. And then I go back to my vacation. Um, and that's, I, I just, I say that just kind of um, humorously because I, I, that's not necessarily uh, the case, but I guess what I, the point is, is that, like I said before, you know, sometimes your experience is a mile wide and an inch deep and you have so much on your plate and so many different things and sometimes you just need to leverage them 
for capacity purposes, right? And so you do need to say, I need to get this done tomorrow. And, and you know, you leverage them for that kind of overflow support um, where it's not worth the headcount um, on an incremental basis. And so, um, so that's something I definitely will leverage them for in busy times is just kind of added, added personnel and overflow. And from my perspective, it's, I think more about not what do I send to outside counsel, but how do I manage that relationship? My, my husband was um, in-house for many years and he's <laughs> a stronger personality than potentially I am. And so he would tell his clients, I want you to put a post-it on your computer that says, make me look good, make Nick look good, my husband. I don't need my outside counsel to make me look good. I'll, I'll take care of that on my own, but I don't want you to make my life harder. And so I always have a conversation with outside counsel. I don't want to have to chase them for things. Please don't like, don't leave things to the last minute. Don't give me something that has to be reviewed immediately because we're in meetings all day. And so I, I need some time to find, uh, to find a space to review materials like pleadings and litigation. Um, and then don't send me work that I have to redo. Um, and I am, I have a pretty, I have a pretty high standards when it comes to, to outside counsel. So I will get in and rewrite briefs if I have to, but then I won't be using that attorney further. Um, so I'm also, one of the things that, that struck me when I was outside counsel was we don't get a lot of feedback from clients. Um, if you're pitching for work and you don't get it, you often don't know why, unless they say it's just, you're too expensive, which we would get at Paul Hastings. Um, if, but if you got work, you wouldn't necessarily know why if it was a pitch. And then, you know, what was going well, what wasn't. And so I try to be very direct with my um, with my outside counsel to let them know what they're doing great, what's really helpful, um, point out when they've done something that just made my job a lot easier, and also let them know if things aren't going well. Um, when I ask firms to do pitches, I'll tell them why they didn't get it. Because um, I think that that helps improve the relationship and the work that you get from them. And so that's been really helpful for me is just being as transparent as I can be with folks so that they understand where the decisions are coming from or where the pressure points are coming from, because then they can, they can do better. And not just, not just for me, but for all their clients. Thanks. Um, thank you guys for those answers. I'll add that there is a range of outside counsel that you'll get. Um, I've had to deal with panel counsel for insurance matters where you don't have control over who's selecting the council. Heck, you don't have control over what you're going to settle about, settle for. So those are interesting. Um, you get a panel council can be a wide range to really, really great, which I've had to, like Anna, Hannah said, um, having to rewrite everything. <laughs> um, and those are, unfortunately, you can't necessarily terminate them. Um, but so next question is for um, Mike and Todd. What is the biggest challenge you have faced being in-house? Um, I mean, I, I think somebody talked about it earlier, and I, I would say probably a, a bit earlier in, in my career, it was, it was much more difficult for me, but being okay with your counsel or your guidance not being followed by your, your business team, I think that's a, a skill that you learn, and, you know, you, you definitely, like, don't, <laughs> you can't take, like, any, any personal offense to it, and, and like, especially if you, like, you know, poured in, you know, a good amount of time and, and think that, whatever decision that the business team is making is just just incorrect or just like going to lead us off a cliff. Like, you know, how I kind of, kind of, um, kind of I guess, reframed my position on this is as long as I, you know, did my job and, and really, you know, provided that, that counsel that allowed my business team or, or, or the decision maker to make a truly educated um, decision, then, you know, I'm okay living with it. And, and you know, once that decision's made, I'll, I'll, I'll support it because that's, you know, I'm part of the organization. Um, but, you know, I think early on in my career, it was, it was, it was a bit tough. Like, like why, why, you know, I'm, I'm the attorney, I'm the attorney, but again, you know, you're in-house now. And, and so you're not, you know, the, the top priority, the top dog sort of thing in, in, in many situations. Um, and then the other kind of challenge is, is learning how to manage your time effectively in-house. Um, just, you know, the panels talk about it, but, and, and those who are working in house just know, like, I mean, we just get looped into so many different meetings. Um, and I laugh about it. I'm like, you know, if we started like giving a, a, a fake bill, you know, and see like what, what the time is that, you know, it, essentially that we're being, you know, like the, the cost of us attending all these different meetings and are we truly a value add to those meetings? And 
like I know before I said like I, I love being part of like the good the the strategic decision making um, calls and things like that. But you know, not every meeting that I attend is is like where I'm actually going to be able to bring value. And so understanding that and, and really you know being able to say no or you know contact me if you need you know guidance on you know ABC or something like that. Well, I think my by far and away my biggest challenge in house is is working with Mike Ray. Um, <laughs> Um, just kidding. Um, I think for me, it's kind of two things. Um, one is, in, is the ability to communicate and influence. And because and, in any given day, it's really, you could be working and, and counseling someone that is right, you know, it's the new analyst right out of college, right? And they just, they're so green, they don't understand the business and kind of the issues and figuring out how do I relate to and communicate to that individual to get the right result or to put them on the right path. All the way to the other end is, you know, you could go from a meeting from that environment to a meeting with our CEO and our chair of the board, talking much more strategically on, you know, much bigger significant issues and how am I influencing that audience effectively well and going between the two very quickly and not having a single approach for any individual instance and really treating figuring out how do I influence the right people at the right levels, you know, effectively. I think that is a big challenge um, to do it well. Um, and I think the other thing for me is just, is managing and developing teams, um, you know, is, is making sure the people in my teams are engaged, that they are, um, you know, showing up to work, um, wanting to do their best work that they have the ability to achieve their, you know, their career aspirations, their personal development um, aspirations. And so I think so oftentimes in-house, you know, we think of ourselves as these like technical attorneys and really, you know, you're no different than the business people that build and develop teams and have effective teams and, and having that mindset more often than not taking, you know, not focusing as much on the technical piece of that's important, but making sure that the team is being developed and, and managed appropriately. Thank you. Next question. I'm actually going to skip a question and then go back to it, but I'm going to get um, Carolyn. What class would you recommend to a law school that um, law school student that is interested in going in house um, becoming an in house counsel? I know you had one that you thought would be a great one, and yeah. I know we have a lot of law students on the panel. Yes, I get this question yeah. often, um, and I will say. Um, perhaps bearing the lead, but um, one of the things I always tell people is there is not a single class that I took in law school that I really look back on and think like, this was the class. Like if I hadn't taken this class, I never would have known how to do my job. I know it can be a little overwhelming when you're trying to pick classes once you get out of your 1L year, and there's a lot of well-meaning advice about the types of classes that you should take, um, whether it's based on what's on the bar or um, you should take tax because it's really important to take at least one class that's very regulatory, like the, the, that type of advice. So I really don't think there are any wrong decisions that can be made when it comes to picking law school classes, but I do always really recommend that people take negotiation, which is not technically a legal class, but when you are in-house or really um, uh, as outside counsel as well, it's just, it's a skill that you will use every single day, even when you're interacting with your own coworkers or your clients in terms of helping them to um, craft a strategy that is going to be best from a risk perspective for the company. So um, that's, that's uh, my top recommendation for any law student. So um, last question, I'm going to combine two questions <laughs> for the last one. What do you enjoy being uh, most about being in-house counsel? And then two, what advice would you give somebody looking to become in-house counsel? And that's for everyone. I'd focus on the how we sort of started off this, this call and talking about the importance of networking. So for someone who's looking to be in-house, in I think networking is really important. And I think the challenge is it's not just meeting people, it's meeting people in a scenario in which you can demonstrate your, your value. So things like getting involved in ACC or your lawyers club or um, the, the county bar association, those are opportunities for you to sort of demonstrate 
your capabilities, your, you know, communication, your leadership presence, all of those things. And so it's not just meeting people, it's really meeting them in a way where you can demonstrate your, your value. And so that's why, you know, being at a firm can be really helpful as you meet people and they go to other firms or they go in house and you can stay in contact with them. Um, or doing these sort of extracurricular type activities where you can kind of put your your performance um, out there for people to see that can be really helpful more so than, um, you know, kind of blind outreach and asking to get coffee because folks won't have a great sense of your capabilities just through those conversations. They will when you can get out there and kind of show them what you got. I would I'll follow up and just say, um, I guess my advice is, you know, just like first and foremost, make sure you do great work. Um, so I, I think that, you know, is gonna help build your reputation. And, 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 you know, I think, you know, part of the network, networking is also like some of your colleagues will help you network. You know, that's how, um, you know, I, I helped get my, you know, I got my foot in the door at my, my first job of, you know, one of my colleagues understood that I do good work. And, and so she was, she felt comfortable referring me to the hiring manager um, at, at the first place that, you know, I, I started working at. Um, and then also, you know, it, to the extent that you can try to understand the culture of whatever um, company you're, you know, you're going to be um, applying at, you know, whether that's through the, you know, the, the formal interview process, or, you know, if you're able to speak with anybody that, you know, currently works there or previously worked there, you know, just understand that culture, because I think, you know, everybody on the panel will say, like, they, the in-house, you know, culture at each different, at each organization is different, or, or can be, you know, and it can be significantly different. And so, like, I know there's, you know, companies that kind of actually run more like a law firm with their legal departments. And then some, you know, places are kind of, you know, you're, you're one, two, three attorney um, kind of departments too. So, you know, I think you, that's really important to understand, like, what culture do you think you'll operate best in? Um, my advice, I... I think there's a lot of ways, and I think the world has, has changed significantly, certainly since you know I graduated law school in terms of paths to get in-house. I mean, the, the panel is a great representation, I think, of that. Um, you know, I would say just be um be scrappy, right? And just understand, you know, reach out to people, um, stay in contact, um, understand that, you know, people might say, you know, traditional, go to a law firm, you know, work for a client go in house, like, and, and that might work, right? But there's other ways and just to understand that there's a lot of ways to get there. And sometimes it's, you know, it's a Z and not a straight line. Um, and then no matter what you're doing um, in terms of the role and where you're at, to Mike's point, I'll always do your best work. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me. I'll get calls from recruiters sometimes. It's like, you know, so-and-so thinks you'd be great. I'm like, I haven't talked to so-and-so in 20 years or 15 years or vice versa. They'll ask me, do you know anyone that would be good for a role? And I'm thinking back and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, I remember, you know, someone I worked with 10 years ago, that would be great. Right. And it's just, so you just never know how some of your interactions will come back and, and provide opportunity or relationships. And so always be cognizant of that. Never burn a bridge. I really agree with the advice that's been given already on how to go in-house. So maybe I'll focus instead on what my favorite part of being in-house is. Um, I mean, besides the obvious of um, working for a sports team, which makes it very fun. Um, what The thing I really love about being in-house is that my clients are my coworkers. And so I get to develop much more of a relationship with the people that I work with. Um, they come to trust me more. I get a better sense of what their strengths and weaknesses are. We're all working together for the same goal. And for good or for ill, I have to live the cycle of the advice that I give them. It's not like being outside counsel where you give advice and it's either not the right advice or it doesn't get implemented the way that you advised it to. Like you don't ever have to clean up that mess in all likelihood as outside counsel, they'll hire somebody else with a different set of specialties to do that. Um, but, uh, if I give advice that doesn't get followed or I don't give the right advice, like I, I've got to eat that on the other side of it. So it's got its ups and downs for sure. But I really, um, I, I find that extra level of accountability is really, um, helpful for me. But as I said, the most 
the thing I enjoy most is getting to have such a great relationship with the people that I'm advising. Well, that, um, so we ended our panel portion um, and we are going to open it up. We have about nine minutes left for questions. Luke. Hi, I just want to start by saying thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to um, discuss with us. Uh, I know we all appreciate it. Um, I had a question kind of directed towards anybody and maybe all of you who are kind of um, in the jack of all trades category where you don't really do anything specific. My question is kind of like, if you are going into a firm, like I'm, I'm starting in corporate. And my concern is that when I go in house, I want to be doing things more than just corporate. And if that was the case for any of you, how did you leverage yourself in either the interview process or in marketing yourself to make sure that you could you know, get your hands on as many issues as possible. And um, just the intricacies that kind of come along with making sure that, um, you know, the scope of your work doesn't stay so um, one dimensional. So I'm open up to anyone who might be able to answer. Um, I'm happy to answer that, uh, or at least partly because I, I would say first and foremost, it's a great question. Um, you know, at a firm, if you're in the corporate department, um, learn as much as you can, get as much experience as you can, be, be, become the best technical attorney you can. And then when you're looking for in-house roles, look for environments that have a dynamic array, a vast array of issues that you're dealing with. If you're at a small company that does one thing, you know, maybe it's not international, maybe it's not heavily regulated, you might not have the breadth of experience to a lot of issues. Um, but I think it, my experience is, you know, you go in house, you demonstrate value, your ability to lead cross functional teams, people, and you can take on additional responsibility over time. For instance, you know, I was at Harley, you know, I came in after a corporate experience at a firm, you know, M&A public company kind of thing. And, you know, after a couple of years, I was managing the patent portfolio, right, and doing supply chain, um, you know, agreements and things like that. So. Um, I think it's just looking at your in-house environment and the scope of the issues and things that they're dealing with and it, a good indication of the things you can get involved in. I'm wondering, can I answer also? Sorry, I know I'm just the moderator, but so I have, I came from, I was litigation and did employment defense and general, litig um, general commercial litigation. And I came to Great Call, which was a small company that was eventually bought by Best Buy and did solely contracts. I remember looking at the application that they had me, again, I knew somebody that was general counsel. They had me fill up the application after I got an interview. And I remember, I remember looking at it and seeing words like SAS and stuff. And I was like, I don't know what any of these words are. I can't do this. And I called my friend, Mike, who was general counsel, was like, I can't do this role. And he's like, Josie, you have the skill set, and you have the expert, like, I can teach you how to do contracts. I can teach you what is important to look at a contract. What he really, what they really needed was somebody that fit the corporate comp, um, the corporate corporate ugh, corporate culture. Somebody that he knew was a hard worker and had the work ethic that they would need. Somebody that did good work that was able to communicate with others. Um, those were kind of the. The, they didn't need me to be a corporate attorney, although a lot of like a lot of in-house counsel will be looking for, oh, do you fit those boxes of what we want? But when you get in there and you start talking to them, they're really looking at like, is this somebody I want to work with? Is this somebody that I can trust with making decisions for the company that's not going to put us at risk? Is this someone that can communicate? Um, and those were kind of the skills that he saw in me that I didn't even see in me. And now I do regulatory, I do privacy. I don't, I same thing with um, Carol, Carolyn is like, I call myself, I describe myself jack of all trades, master of none. I do a little bit of everything. Just, I have enough knowledge to be, I guess, dangerous, but not enough to get like, really sink my teeth into anything. Uh, Jason. Uh, 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'll keep it quick because I know we're running out of time. But I'm I'm currently in-house in a role where I am the first in-house attorney hire. And so there is no legal department. Things are very disorganized. I mean, there's no matter or contract management system. There's no clear view of legal spender, outside counsel expender, even a, a workflow for engaging outside counsel. And I'm still trying to get my mind around how I even get visibility on all this stuff, much less get it organized. And so we can actually build an internal legal function. And I'm wondering if, if any of you who've worked in these small in-house departments have advice on, on that type of situation. Thank you. So, I, I mean, I've, I've worked at, um, you know, a company where I was one of two attorneys and the company was a, a bit more established. So you know, I, I don't have an apples to apples comparison. I will say that we, we, you know, leverage the free uh, free resources as much as possible, but, you know, other sort of industry kind of um, resources, you know, I'm, I'm sure the ACC has has tons of, of resources that you can tap into. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's so I don't have a, a ton of great advice just because I haven't gone through it, but I do think that um, you know the, the, as, as much as you can kind of get organized and, and structured and and kind of just chip away at it so you're not looking at everything all at once. Um, you know, try to kind of target like what's the most critical. Like if this went wrong or mm -hmm. if, if we had a slip up here, you know, I'm mm -hmm. just trying to prioritize that. I would advise um, for what you don't know, hire really good outside counsel that has expertise in that. So if it's like privacy, if you're a customer facing or with all the new privacy laws, hire some someone for that. If you need to do a retention policy, hire there's outside organizations that can consult on that. And I'm a big person. I'm big on processes and procedures. So when I started, it was kind of like, you know, I was at a small startup and it was wild, wild west. People would come to me at like 4.45 and be like, Josie, this software agreement expires tonight. We need you to sign it. I'm just like, oh my God, like, do, do we, is it in the budget? Does your boss know? Like, why didn't you come to this <laughs> two weeks um, before? And so I actually set up like a contract intake form that everyone, I'm like, we, we're not doing this anymore. You have to fill this out. My my timeline for, for you to get it to, to get it back to you is going to be, you know, five to seven days. And that's just the first initial draft because we're going to have to we'll probably have to negotiate this. But setting realistic expectations that you can't come to me, you know, five minutes, a half an hour before I'm going to leave and then say we have to renew this software license and also making sure that the proper people are signing off like. I have VP, the VP of the department signs off, finance signs off. If you have a procurement department, they sign off. Like if there's security making, if you're, if it's an um, back house thing, making sure that if you have a security or tech department that they've signed off to make sure that, you know, this isn't um, a company that's going to like sell all your company information or not notify you if there's a data breach. So um, those type of things, but I definitely think, um, hiring experts that can help you and um, maybe getting somebody else so you don't have to be the only one. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on that. I think we may, we have one more minute, maybe time for one more question if anybody has one. Doesn't look like it. So I want to thank everyone so much for coming. We had a wonderful turnout. Um, thank you for all the, oh, um, all the, oh, that's a clap. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you for all the law students, especially that um, came to the panel. This panel was specifically directed at you. Um, and I know that you have lots of paths and um, a lot of you will be graduating and are kind of wondering what to do. I'm hoping this gave you some just an oversight and view of what it's like to be in house counsel. Um, good luck with finals, those with the bars. For everyone else, thank you so much. And for our panelists, you guys are amazing. And it is a joy to be a part of ACC with all of you. Thank you. And Thanks, goodbye. everyone.